Good evening, everybody. Dr. Hickey here, starting the uh, presentation on Chapter 10, Crustal Deformation. A um, couple of things before I get going. I'm going to watch the time on these videos, and I may divide this into a couple of different parts uh, so that I can put it up on YouTube as opposed to uh, Viddler, possibly. I haven't, I haven't decided how I'm going to approach that yet. We'll just see how it goes. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing I want to do is remind you some of this stuff we have at least discussed earlier this semester when we were talking about uh, earthquakes and other things, stress, strain, you know, deforming the rock systems, how things might deform um, elastically when you, you know, impart the pressure and you release it, it snaps back into form. When it deforms plastically, it actually bends and takes on a new form. Or when the conditions don't allow it to react in either one of those cases, rock material at depth at higher temperatures and pressures can um, you know, even do things like uh, deform brittly and actually break and, and that's basically when rock systems break and movement occurs a lot of energy is released and, and earthquakes occur. In this instance we're going to look at the results of what happens when those types of deformations occur um, not so much the elastic deformation when you bend something, release the stress, um, and it unstrains itself going back into its original form, but actually more what happens when you apply the stress and either it takes on a new form via uh, plastic deformation or when you apply the stress and the system fails and then there's some sort of movement associated with it quite often. Um, that happens along fault systems. That's where earthquakes originate. And those are the types of things we talked about previously. Okay, so in this little image here, this is a uh, an outcrop of some uh, relatively young formations out on the west coast of the United States in California. And here is an example of both types of deformation. Uh, over here on the left-hand part of the slide, over here, you can see where the beds have actually been contorted down and coming back up again, and they've actually taken on a new form. You know, they were originally horizontal, more or less, and after they've undergone, you know, the stress, the force being imparted to these rocks under different conditions, uh, and those rocks strain, they took, they actually deformed. They kept that de deformed shape uh, after the pressure was released and was brought to the surface. That's plastic deformation that's basically occurring there. Uh, over here on this side of the image, you see this dashed line coming down and these two arrows signifying uh, where movement has occurred. And basically what that's showing you is a place where that system has failed brittily and movement has occurred along each side of a fault. Now these types of deformation can occur at the macro scale. This is, well, there's a, a lamp, I mean a light post there to show you, give you some sense of scale of how big this thing is. Or a micro scale. I mean, there's a Swiss Army knife, and you can see that this thing, you know, the, the folds in, the, in this little uh, rock system are actually significantly smaller. Okay. So, to remind you, stress is the force that's actually applied to an object, and it can be where we either try to pull something apart, compress it together, or where you have differential stress acting on it to actually shear it. Okay. When we looked at this earlier, we talked about things like uh, when you had compression occurring, you have convergent boundaries, things like subduction zones. Well, it's actually the places where folds happen and certain types of faults can occur. When you start to stretch the environment, extensional settings, uh, those are places that ultimately ends up being uh, like a divergent boundary, uh, but you're actually pulling the system apart under tensional stress. Then in the last case, we're trying to move things literally side by side, such as you would on a transform fault or transform boundary. Um, you know, that's another type of stress that ends up straining the rocks in a certain way, referred to as a shear stress Okay, uh, that's being applied to that. Now once you apply the stress, that force, it can also uh, go in there and actually uh, cause a change in the shape of the object where that stress is being applied, that is referred to as the strain. 
So here are the actual definitions of some of the things we're going to be dealing with in this uh, presentation or in this chapter. Uh, depending on, as it says here, a number of factors that are associated with, with what's going on in the system, a material, an earth material, may behave in different ways. And basically, it will fold when you apply stress, and the rocks are such that they will deform plastically. In other words, they'll bend, take on a new shape when the stress is relieved, and uh, it keeps that shape like the fold you saw on the first slide, or one of the earlier slides. When you have some sort of brittle deformation occur, and when that deformation is associated with actually movement along a planar surface, that's a fault. Um, you know, we've talked about those sorts of things as well. That's when the thing is, the system is actually failing brittly. Another type of brittle deformation you can get is something that's referred to as jointing, and this is just basically an area where the system starts to open up for various reasons, and we'll look at that towards the end of this pres presentation. Uh, types of deformation, elastic, where things are recoverable, plastic, where it's non-recoverable and takes on a new form, or brittle, where it actually fails in something else like fracturing, faulting, jointing, and other things happen. And there are a number of uh, factors that actually go into influencing how a different type of earth material, different type of rock system, will behave. One is the type of rock system. Two is something that's referred to as the confining pressure. In other words, as you're applying a different stress coming in from, let's say, the sides, there might be other ways that the system is being pressurized from above and below, that's going to you know, influence exactly how that deformation moves forward. Uh, other things like heat, the rate at which that stress is applied, and other internal pressures that might be going on within the earth material as this deformation or heating is occurring. So again, there's a host of things going on there. Just remembering a couple of those last things will actually be helpful uh, on anything that I'd ask you on the next test. Okay, um, once we, you know, or once the Earth system goes in and actually, um, you know, gets into a condition where stress has been applied, the rock system has been strained, and something's happened to cause some sort of deformation, and we get new features being formed, which could be things like uh, folds of various type, fracture systems, faults, joints. Uh, as a geologist, you know, we need to express how these things exist out in the world and give some indication of the orientation of these things in space, okay? And what's being shown in this slide here is one of the ways in which geologists determine the attitude of these types of features, the attitude being some sense of direction in which that uh, bedding surface or false system or major axis of a fold belt or whatever might be trending. And then something else that geologists classify relative to this attitude things uh, is something relative to the, the inclination of those beds and how they might be going in, uh, dipping down into the surface. So the terms that are associated with these things are referred to as strike and dip. Strike being the directional trend okay, of that geological feature, a fault, a fold belt with its major axis going in a certain way, uh, relative to true north, and then the dip of those beds as they actually plunge or, or dip down into the subsurface. Okay, I'm actually going to come back to the slide here in a moment when I start a new presentation, getting up to about nine minutes in length here, and then I'll move forward with strike and dip here in a moment and give you a little bit more explanation there. I'll be right back.